worship. Uh, just like any other day, any other Sunday, we worship uh, in the in the beginning of the church. They worshiped in homes, and this morning that's what what most of us will be doing. Uh, so let's not be making breakfast, and let's let's not be just doing this, that, and the other. Let's let's turn our attention to God and worship Him this morning. Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to worship today. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our live feed here from the church. And we're grateful um, to be able to worship in your home today. Uh, thank you so much for being a part. Just a couple of directions. And we've got someone right now that's, uh, that's heading up our, our live stream. So I encourage gracious interaction. Um, talk with each other, share with each other thoughts on the message, on the service. But, but the goal today is to worship. To, to enjoy the Lord, as we always do, as we always do on Sunday. So I want to read to you um, as we begin uh, from the 46th Psalm. And I pray that this will, will comfort your heart as it speaks to, um, to uh, the reality that we're in right now. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled. Though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. I want to begin this morning by, by praying with you, so I, I invite you to, to pray with me. Father, we thank you and, and glorify you for this glorious day that you've given us as families to be, to be together. Um, there is a, a great reminder today um, given to us that, that the church is far more than a building. Though we miss it, though we miss being together physically, I, I know I do. I, I, miss, I miss seeing everyone this morning. But I know, God, that the church is the people of God, believers in Christ. And today, you are doing a good work all over the world. 
And I want to pray that, that we would realize and we would remember today that you are our refuge, our shelter, our hiding place. And, and in you we find strength, in you we find joy, in you we find peace everlasting. I pray, to, I pray today, God, that this service um, would, would be a, a time of great praise and, and worship right from where people are. I pray from their couches they, they would lift their hands in praise. I, I pray, God, um, as they're with their children, that they would enjoy the time together as a family. I, I'm thankful, God, that, that in this moment we're getting a, a clear picture of, uh, of what the New Testament church was like as families met from, from home to home, day in and day out, worshiping the Lord. And, and I pray, God, that the Spirit of, of, of the Lord um, w- would move greatly in our services I pray that your word would, 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 would resound with truth, and I pray that hearts would be changed for eternity today. We, we're trusting you in that, God. We, we don't know who's, who's listening, who's watching, but um, we, we certainly do know um, that you can reach our hearts in a, in a mighty and awesome way um, if we will open ourselves up to what you want to do today. I want to pray for churches all across um, the world who are doing just this, who, who are meeting online um, preachers today who may be preaching to, uh, to empty seats, help them to know that they're not preaching to empty hearts. I pray that the church today would be encouraged, and I pray that there would be a whole lot of glory to give God for what you do today. This may be the seedbed for a great revival to, um, to happen um, throughout, throughout this world. So God be glorified in, in our worship time together. I pray that we would sing with all of our hearts. I, I pray, God, that, that, we would, that we would listen intently to your word And I pray that we would be forever changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship together. Join us as we praise God for his amazing grace. We sing amazing grace.
Amen. God, you are so faithful and you are so good and we will praise you. We will find reason today to praise you. The fact that we have life, the fact that we have the very breath in our lungs at this moment, we want to praise you. And and God, I pray that we would choose to praise today. I know that there are a lot of things that are on our hearts and and, and many things that concern us and may even bring others to to be frightened or to fear, to panic. Um, But God, you are still faithful. And, and we will praise you today as we, as we have sung, as we will open up your word. Um, I pray for your truth to illuminate greatly in our hearts today. Um, I, I want to pray um, in this moment uh, for, for the gospel to be very clear. I pray, God, to, to rid um, uh, our families, those that are listening today, of any distractions so that they can hear your precious word. And I pray, God, that we would have many reasons to praise you, to thank you. We, um, we ask you, God, that you would just enter into this time and, and, Lord, speak loudly and clearly through your word. I thank you, God, for, for everyone that has made this day possible. Um, we are grateful for those that have worked so hard to, to give the best, uh, the best presentation that we can of the gospel today. And we're trusting you now, Lord, in your spirit to do, to do your work that only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so, so gather with me um, this morning in your Bibles to the book of Luke 22. This is the second week that we've been in this, uh, in this chapter together, um, but we're in Luke 22, and we're going to start in a moment in verse 39. Uh, there's so much of a text that, um, that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go point by point um, through, through the Word together as, as we study, but we're going to start in verse 39. And remember, we're in a series together as a church called Portraits of the Passion. We're taking a look at the last week of the life of Jesus, and, and, and we're seeing his love on display. Uh, we're, we're seeing, um, we're seeing uh, his, his passion, his heart, um, his suffering uh, for humanity uh, so that we could be saved. Now, as we begin this morning, we're focusing in on the last night um, that, that Christ was alive before, of course, his, his crucifixion. And, and I don't want to bring us, uh, us down today uh, but, but I want for you, for the moment, to think about uh, the darkest night of your life, or maybe some of the darkest seasons of your life. I'm talking about the difficult moments. I'm talking about discouraging moments. I'm talking about hard times. Think about where you were. Uh, it may be something from a long time ago, uh, or it could be something that you're going through right now. But I want to ask you, how did you get through that? How did you get through that? And how are you getting through that right now if you're in a dark moment? It may have been uh, when you lost a loved one. It may have been uh, through a marital problem. It may be uh, through, through a sickness or a family problem, maybe a strained child or an abusive parent, an abusive spouse, an addicted family member. It might have been through a time of financial distress or a battle with temptation or sin uh, or strongholds of your own. Uh, or maybe a, a time of chastisement you know, fr- from the Lord. Uh, that might have been a, a dark time for you. Or it may have been a time of spiritual dryness where you didn't feel like that, uh, that, that the Lord was hearing you or seeing you. I mean, the possibilities are, are endless. I, I'm just being honest you know, for, for, for just a moment. Th- this week alone or at least the the last couple of weeks with all eyes on the circumstances of the coronavirus, that has truly been, uh, maybe it will be documented as one of the the toughest, darkest moments um, in our nation's history. Many have called what we're going through right now a a a once-in-a-century kind of thing. But in those dark times, do you look at those moments as mere failures? Do you look at them as moments that you'd rather forget about? Do you look at those times as losses or wasted time and experiences? Or do you look at them with a different perspective? Do you look at them with a, with a different view, a, a different mindset? Because I want you to remember that some of the greatest moments in history happened when people were at the lowest of times. Consider these. Uh, these were provided by um, uh, Oz Hillman in his book, change agent but he but he rem- he recount or remembers a, a few things like like this the apostle paul the apostle paul wrote many of his epistles from a prison cell not on a beach not on vacation but from a prison cell and instead of paul mulling over uh, his circumstances instead of him saying uh, staying in a hole and and rotting away paul writes as a prisoner of the lord Instead, he says, you know what, I'm not a a prisoner of any system, of any government, of any ruler. 
I, I, I'm a prisoner, a servant, a bond servant of Christ. And I might be locked up in this moment, but I've never been freer than in this moment now as he writes his epistles. John Bunyan. John Bunyan is the man who wrote the second most selling book of all time, Pilgrim's Progress. And, and John Bunyan grew up in, in poverty, but he taught himself how to read. He struggled with feelings of not being forgiven by God. His wife died of a sudden illness, and he turned totally to God in his pain. He began to preach throughout England, and back then, uh, you had to have a license to preach. Uh, I mean, like a physical license to preach, and he was arrested and eventually imprisoned for 12 years because he didn't have a license to proclaim the Word of God. Now, while in prison, he produced the Pilgrim's Progress. Listen, God turns our messes into messages. God turns our, our, our low points into high points, opportunities to be his witness. There was a well-known Chinese leader. He, he was, his name was Watchman Nee, and he was in isolation as he battled tuberculosis, and he was forced to, to, to be uh, to social distance. He was forced to get away in isolation, but it was there that God, uh, that God showed him that he would use isolation to develop his character, and he became one of the greatest leaders in all of China. John the Apostle penned the letter to the churches in Asia Minor, known as Revelation, from an island called Patmos in exile. David wrote, the, wrote some of the Psalms in caves, in hiding. Psalm 34, Psalm 57, Psalm 142. Each of them reveals a low point in life. And I'm sure David, John, uh, John Bunyan, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, we're thinking about um, Paul. All of them in these low moments, perhaps they were wondering, God, where are you? Uh, 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 I, I'm, why am I going through this? I thought I was your man. But yet, in those mo mo low moments in life, you may be there right now. There may come a time where you have to make a decision and you have to ask yourself, am I going to stay there? Am I going to, am I going to see this as condemnation? Am I going to see this low moment as a defeat? Am I going to see it as a loss? Am I going to see it as a time to mourn? Or am I going to come out of that grave? Am I going to let Jesus work in that situation? Am I going to let Jesus turn my sadness into joy? Am I going to allow Jesus to turn my, my difficulties into a testimony of his grace and salvation? Do I believe that I'm going to be defeated in these circumstances? Or is there victory in Jesus? Will I allow God to take the pain and, and turn it into praise? Will I turn those dark nights uh, and, and take those dark nights and allow the Lord to shine light into the circumstance. If there was ever a dark season, a dark night, the Lord Jesus experienced it with his followers on the night of his betrayal, just hours before his crucifixion. What a week for him. Just to recap the last couple of weeks with you all. Uh, uh, arriving into Jerusalem one moment, great crowds surrounding him, praising his name, declaring him to be the, 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 the son of God, declaring him to be the Messiah, the, the son of David. What a high moment. A good moment, a mountaintop moment, really an exciting moment. But you fast forward a few days, and he's with his disciples in one of the sweetest times of fellowship as they take Passover together, but also one of the most sobering times as he shares with them to remember him. Remember him. What do you mean, remember me? Remember me because I'm going to give my life, his body the bread, his blood the wine, to be poured out for the sins of the world. And then just a few moments later, Jesus is with his disciples here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, by the way, uh, you know, it, that's, a, that's a really big word for oil press. That's what it means in, in the Greek, oil press or olive press. Jesus had come to the garden. And, and it's late in the night, and, and they, they had been in the upper room, and they had, they had spent Passover together, and now... They have descended through the streets of the city. They, they walk out of the fountain gate of the old the walled city, and they ascend to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the disciples are with him just to set things in motion. The disciples are with him except for Judas. Judas is making a deal with the devil right now. And I can't help but to think it. But as they head to the garden that last night, what if Jesus saw something that uh, the disciples couldn't see? More to come on that. If that were you or me, and, I'm, and I want you to try to put yourself in the perspective of Jesus, but would you have 
crucifixion and victory in mind at the same time. If you knew that your betrayer was coming with a mob to shackle you and to beat you and to crucify you, would joy be on your mind? Would victory be on your mind? Maybe an escape would be on your mind. Maybe, uh, maybe anger at your betrayer. I'll never pick Judas again. <laughs> or, or another plan. I, I wonder what Jesus was thinking. We get an inside look. We get a view of this portrait of Christ's passion here on this final night. I'm going to share with you as we look into this passage some details of the portrait. I'm going to share with you three as we look at this text together, starting in verse 39. Let, let's see the first thing. I want you to see the seriousness of the moment in the garden. The seriousness of the moment in the garden. Some things to look at here in Luke chapter 22. Let's start, uh, let's start uh, together in, um, in, verse 30, in verse 39. It says, Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. Let's read verse 40. When he came to that place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn, verse 41, from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it's in your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Let's stop right there for a moment. Now it was a normal thing for Jesus to spend time in the garden of Gethsemane. It was a normal thing for him to be in the Mount of Olives. It was a nice, quiet spot for prayer. It was a nice, quiet place for reflection, for, for rest. It's a place that's supposed to be used for serenity and security. Not on this night. On this night, Judas knew. This is why this is such a big deal. Judas knew exactly where Jesus would be. Jesus didn't just pick out the, the Mount of Olives as a place to be. You know, like this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Jesus spent a lot of times... In the Mount of Olives. So Judas knew where to find, where to find Christ. A place uh, that was supposed to be, you know, a place of rest. Not so much tonight. On this night, Judas, knowing where Jesus would be, was leading a band of Roman soldiers. Scripture says a multitude of soldiers uh, to, to arrest him. In just a few short hours, he would be humiliated. He would be abused. He would suffer shame. Pain unimaginable. As, as he is uh, crucified on the cross. And in that moment, Christ would become sin for us. In that moment, Christ would be separated uh, from the Father. This is the cup that Jesus w was about to drink. So you can see, this is not a normal night in the garden. This is a serious night. Some serious things about to happen. Normally there's peace. Normally there's relaxation. Normally there's fellowship. But not on this night. This night is strangely different. Jesus takes his disciples with him. I, I think he took a few, by the way. Peter, James, and John, we know, um, were there. But they go into the garden, and Jesus tells them in the seriousness of this moment, he says, pray. Pray. Now, now I find it unique that Jesus calls his disciples to pray with him there. Why not prepare why not prepare for the entourage that's about to come? Why not, why not protect? You're going to see in a moment that Peter tried that out. It's a good thing he was a fisherman and not a swordsman because he had a terrible shot. Okay, why not relocate? Why not travel? Why not panic? Jesus tells them to pray. Let it be a strong reminder to us today. When in, when in life's most difficult moments, okay, in the dark nights, you're going to be tempted, I'm going to be tempted to give into all kinds of things. Fear, anxiety, uh, worry, doubt. We've got questions. We've got troubles. The pressure is going to be great. But in those moments, we are not called as believers to escape. We're not called as believers to self-protect. We're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not called as believers to, to panic or to protest. We're not called to cower in fear. As believers in Christ, and, and, and think about what that means. I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm a follower of, uh, of Jesus. I follow and know the sovereign and eternal Lord and Savior of humanity. I serve the conquering King. I serve the Messiah. I am saved, called, and I have a changed life. And, and my life is to look at this world in a different perspective. We are saved and called to live differently, believe differently, respond differently than that of the world. And I know what the feeling is, and I know what the temptation is. The temptation is to give into fear 
The temptation is to panic. The temptation is to be angry about the circumstance. The temptation is to be impatient about the circumstance. The temptation is to doubt and to live as if we have no hope. But instead, Jesus calls us to pray. He calls us to pray. Uh, Charles Converse, who wrote the the famous hymn, he, he said, What peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. You say, you don't know what I'm facing. I, you, you don't know what I've been through. It's easy to just pray, to just say pray. Let me ask you this in all love and sincerity. What other God-glorifying option do you have? <laughs> He's all we have. How else are you going to get through this storm? This circumstance. Whom else do you have to turn to? If, if, if I were not a believer, sure, I, I guess I could, I could go to substances. Sure, I could turn to another option. Sure, I could look to the government. Sure, I could ask the news anchors. Sure, I could seek my friends and, and my family. But I've got the Lord. Whom else is there that will give me peace like he does? Do you, want, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Jesus here isn't giving his disciples the last option. He's giving them the best option. He's giving them the only option as far as we should be concerned as followers of Christ. Because here's the reality of the moment. In that garden, there are going to be battles that are going to be fought. In the dark of this night, there are going to be a number of battles being fought. And those battles could not be won with physical combat. Peter teaches us that. They couldn't be won with weapons. They couldn't be won with mere military schemes and and plans and strategies. This battle was against the devil himself and demons and and the worst that hell could produce. Our sin, the evil and rebellion that's in our hearts were on full wage war attack against the sinless son of God. And Jesus says, pray, pray about it. The battle cannot be won on your own. The battle cannot be won with your own clever ideas. This battle has to be fought and won with the Lord. And Jesus calls his disciples to pray because he knows not only what faces him, he knows what faces them. He says, pray that you might not enter into temptation. What temptations were there in the garden? Uh, Let's consider a few. There was the temptation to give in to fear. Now, Jesus comforted his disciples just a short time before the Garden of Gethsemane ever happens. He speaks peace into their lives. And and, and I love, okay, I want you to to, to just maybe jot down John chapter 14, read the whole chapter, okay? But in John chapter 14, Jesus constantly tells them, do not be afraid, all right? Don't let your heart be troubled. And, And the peace that Jesus was declaring to his disciples to have was not just a, a, a mere peace in the midst of war or distress. He, he, he spoke complete peace over them. We're talking about peace that brings completeness, peace that brings wholeness, peace that brings satisfaction, peace that brings true joy, contentment. When, when you are enjoying the peace of God, you are resting in the peace of God, and there is none like the peace that he offers. See, see, the world without Christ rests in the peace of resource. Okay, riches, personal comforts, things that we can control, things that we can hold, things that we can see, things that we can use, things that are in our hands, in our eyesight, that we know can be of help and comfort physically. But Christ's peace, that, that's way different. Our source is the Lord. Our comfort is in him. Our hope is built on him. Our joy is found perpetually in what he gives. And our sights are not supposed to be on on this earth, but what is above this earth. Our hearts are fixated on the Lord. And when that happens, there is peace. In the darkest of nights, the world may depend on their ability. We depend on the very power of God. In the world, peace is something you hope for. In the world, peace is something you work for. But in Christ, peace is a gift given to him, given to us through faith in him. In the world, unsaved people think that peace is when we don't have trouble. But Christians enjoy peace even in trouble. Christians enjoy that perfect peace in the midst of the darkest of nights. That's how Jesus was able to tell them, don't be afraid. Don't worry, don't be anxious, don't let your heart be troubled, because in him there would be perfect peace. 
I want us to stop for just a moment. I'm going to ask, who needs peace right now in the dark night you're facing or you're in? Right where you are. Perhaps you need to surrender to the Lord Jesus as your source for peace. He said, don't be afraid. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus knew that fear was going to rear its ugly head in the garden, not just for him, but also for his disciples. He knew Satan was coming, and, and he was going to attempt to strike fear and doubt and worry in their hearts, insomuch that Jesus himself might be tempted to drink another cup. The work that was before him. That's why he said, pray. The burden was going to be great. You're about to see just in a, in a moment that his body is fixing to be under such stress and pressure that he would sweat drops of blood, that he would be overwhelmed by the grief of the world's sins. Incredible anguish. But at the whole time, you don't find Jesus worrying. You don't find him looking for another plan. You don't find him asking for, for, for the way out. You see him going to God in prayer and ultimately submitting to his will. There was the temptation to fall away. There was the temptation to fail. One of the most heart-wrenching moments in this narrative is that we see the frailty of the disciples. I mean, they can't even stay up and pray. They can't even stay awake. I mean, he asked them one thing. You know, you've got one job to do, guys. Pray. And they could not do it. They couldn't do it. I want you to, I want you to take a look um, uh, later on in this text. Let's see uh, verse 42, Jesus says, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he came to disciples and he found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. They should have been praying alongside of him. Instead, they were overcome. We read, they weren't, they weren't just sleepy. Okay, it had been a long night, but they were overcome with their own grief. That's what we read. They were overcome with their own sorrow. They were utterly exhausted to the point of sleep. I, I look at this text, and I've got questions. Okay, I'm like, how could you? That's what I'm asking. How, how could you? How could you sleep on your best friend and leader at a time like this? How could you forget to follow through with your one assignment? You, you've got one job, to pray and seek the Lord. You couldn't do that because you were overwhelmed with your own sorrow and sadness and grief. You failed the Lord. How could you? And I read this, and my own heart is broken because I realize that I failed the Lord as well. I, I try so hard at times to operate in my own power and in my own understanding. And sometimes even, and this is dangerous, but I, I'm just being honest. Sometimes I even try to, try to minister without him. And sometimes you go so far, you, you can go days without a word from him. So when I look in this text, I'm just as broken and beat up as these guys. How could they fall asleep? And then Peter's asking himself, how could you fall asleep? I mean, I, mean, I, I look at this text and, and, and how could I? There, there are so many times where, where we lose the battle. We lose it because we're not faithful even in the simplest of things. God have mercy on us. You, you, you read further that they were, out, they were so out of tune with the Lord in this moment that they resort to fighting, not praying. They resort to fighting. They fought the wrong battles. Yes, in the night there is the temptation to fail our Lord, but Jesus says pray about it. Just pray. It's incredibly fitting that the last miracle Jesus performs was an act of grace. I want you to take a, take a look further. Um, it, it says, let's see, we, we stopped at verse uh, 46. It says, um, and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to kiss Jesus. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest. Of all the people to hit in the face, you hit the high priest's servant. Okay, wrong guy again. Cuts off his right ear. Verse 51 says, Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. Now, I... I I, I find here that, that grace is extended in multiple ways. Um, one, he saves Peter's life in that moment by healing this guy. 
Okay, and the other though, the other though, is that Jesus repairs the damage that Peter had done and he heals Malchus's ear. Malchus is the servant of the high priest, playing in an enemy role, and Jesus heals him. One final moment of grace, and what a powerful picture of why Jesus came in the first place. <laughs> right, think about that. This is all happening so fast. And then you have Judas. He wants out of the fellowship. Even so much that he would agree to betray the Lord. He, he, didn't, he didn't need to fear falling away. He did. He did. The kiss he gives Jesus was, was not from his heart, but from his hypocrisy. Normally, when you kiss somebody, you love them. It, it was customary in Jesus' day to greet one another with a respectful kiss. I am so glad to live in the day we do. You know, that we don't have to do that anymore, right? But, but Judas, he doesn't do it as a way of befriending Jesus. He does it as a way of betrayal. And he falls into that temptation, falls away from everything he knew to be true. His friendship, his following Jesus as a disciple, as a servant, all of that, all of his teachings, all of the opportunities to learn from him, everything, he leaves. As this unfolds, what goes through the minds of the disciples? Now, we don't know that, but one thing that, that sure does hit my heart is the reality that failure is possible. If I'm not following the Lord in obedience, if I'm, not lean, if I'm leaning on my own understanding, if I'm operating in my own power, yes, failure is possible. It's inevitable. A betrayal is possible. Now, one last thing in this point. There is the temptation to forsake Jesus. Something that always bothers me in this passage is what happened to Peter. I relate well with Peter, and it's not because we share the same name, but it's because I can, I can uh, testify that I can be a lot like him. When I'm walking in faith, when, uh, when, when I'm seeing Jesus through a holy and God-given perspective, I'm walking on water. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm declaring that he's the Messiah, the Son of God. I'm seeing him transfigured, you know, in his glory on, on the mountaintop. I'm having those moments. But, but then there are times where I personally take my eyes off of the Lord and, and, and where I have to come down off of the mountain where I forget that Jesus is the same master of the sea and the storm on the mountain and in the valley and that he is everything he said he was. And there are times in my life, I don't know about yours, but there are times where he is denied. Not, not merely just with my words, but maybe my lack of witness as well. We read in verse 54 that Peter followed at a distance. By the way, I've heard a lot of sermons preached on this before where they talk about following Jesus at a distance. That's a dangerous thing to do. I just want you to know, uh, uh, while, while they have good intentions, Peter wasn't even supposed to follow at all. That Actually, if you read in other accounts, um, in other accounts, Jesus actually wants them to be free from this, from this moment. But Peter can't follow directions, and he follows at a distance. That's why he got in so much trouble here. Verse 55 says, Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat down by the fire, looked intently at him and said, That man, pointing at Peter, that man, Peter, was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Now strike one. Remember, Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. Okay, that's one denial. After a little while, uh, another saw him and said, you, you were with them. But Peter said, man, I'm not. Strike two. Then after about an hour passed, another confidently affirmed saying, surely this fellow was with Jesus. He is a Galilean if I've ever seen one. How do we know? How, how, did, how do you know that somebody's a Galilean by his accent? <laughs> okay, in another gospel account, we, we read that you are with him. Your speech gives you away. You sound like a Galilean. You look like a Galilean. You smell like a Galilean. I know you're a Galilean. I can hear it in your voice. You don't know what that is. We, we live in the South. You, you know who's from here and who's not. I've been accused of being a Yankee before in this county. That is not true. I've lived in North Carolina my whole life, okay? All right? Uh, and automatically, automatically, uh, those in Jerusalem would go, he's not one of us Jerusalem people. He's from parts outside. He's a country boy, a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I don't know what you're saying. In other accounts, it says that Peter actually curses. He's so, he's so upset about it. And then, of course, the rooster crows. What is significant is that all four Gospels, bless Peter's heart, all four Gospels record his denial. 
That is significant because, you know, all four Gospels only record a few events that, that many times. Usually, you have an event here or there. You know, you've got one in one of the Gospels, and two, maybe two, maybe three. But, but when you get all four times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all portray the denial of Peter. So poor Peter, you know, all of his buddies are writing about his failure in that moment. And, and all the newspapers going on that day might have said, Closest friend of Jesus or closest disciple of Jesus bells on him. Perhaps in part, that's what the uh, sword was all about. Maybe Peter was trying to, uh, to, to prove that he would be strong in the Lord regardless of what the Lord said to him earlier. Jesus said to him that you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Because, because Peter at one time had kind of puffed himself up and he said, you know what? I'm never going to deny you. That'll, that'll never happen to me. I will not forsake you. If I have to die with you, Okay, if I, if I have to die for it, for, I will not, I will not deny. And, and the other guys might, but I'm, I'm going to stick with you. I never will. And maybe that's why Jesus told him, he, he said, you know what? You will deny me three times. Peter lacked true devotion. Maybe that's why he pulled the sword out and said, you know what? I'm going to prove to you that I am the rock. I am the man. I am the blessed one. I am the leader of these misfits that you call disciples. I'm confident. And then he goes and makes a huge mistake. Jesus was praying. Here, here it is. This is where Peter failed. Jesus was praying. Peter was sleeping. Peter was resisting while Jesus was surrendering. Jesus was submitting to the will of the Father. Peter was doing his own thing. And by the end of this section, he was, he was ashamed to identify with Jesus all along. He says, I don't even know who that guy is. But, but what I want you to walk away remembering today is this. We've all failed the Lord in, in, in some way, some place, some time. What, was Jesus shocked when Peter failed him? No way. He anticipated it. He knew it. He expected it. He, he predicted it. He says, you're going to fall, Peter. You're going you're gonna to fall. You're going to blow it. But Jesus also predicted his restoration. And he says, he says, you're going to be recovered. You're going to be restored. And you're going to be able to lead people to me one day. That's your commission. But Jesus knew he would fail. One person has said that there's three stages to Peter's life. At the fire, under the fire, and eventually on fire. Now, that won't come until later on. But the rooster crows, and Peter just knew in his heart he failed the Lord. One of the most heartbreaking parts about, about this text is when Peter denies the Lord, you read in verse 61, uh, the rooster is crowed and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. What a stare down. What a moment. Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter remembered the word of the Lord. He remembered that Jesus said this, this would happen. And, and every place that, that he would travel from that point on, maybe he would hear a rooster and he would remember that night that he betrayed the Lord or, or, de, or denied the Lord. And, and, and you know what, though? Uh, there, there's something positive here in this text, too. Maybe you can remember this. Maybe, maybe Peter in that moment was comforted, too, that as he heard the rooster crow, he realized Jesus knows what he's talking about. In the darkest of nights, in the most difficult of circumstances, in the most sorrowful moments, Jesus said this would happen. My heart is comforted because he's in control. You know, I told you that in this series, I've tried to remind you throughout that there was never a moment in the passion that Jesus was not in charge. And once again, our hearts are comforted that God is above all and over all, even in our failure, even in our sin, even in our fears, even when the devil himself is out to steal, kill, and destroy, God is in control. So sometimes we can be thankful for the rooster crowing. I want to share with you a second thing. We've seen the seriousness of the moment in the garden. I want you to see the shelter Jesus has in the garden. All right, this is my favorite part of the text. So, so I want you to remember this about the olive press. I want you to remember this about Gethsemane. It was an olive factory, okay? It, it, it was a press. It, it's the place where olives were, were harvested, where oil was extracted. Now, an olive press had, had two stones, uh, basically two stones. There was a heavy stone on top, um, and then there was a, a stone on the bottom that crushed the olives. And, and by the way, olive oil doesn't come from the skins or the meat of the olives. It comes from the pit of the olives. So the olives are crushed. And the oil goes into a channel, and, and then it's brought through a sieve, and it's collected. 
Now, now, olive oil was used for all kinds of things. Olive oil is used for fuel, lighting lamps, uh, refreshing yourself, eating. It's a staple. So Jesus is in an olive factory. It was the place where the olives were pressed. It is significant because Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, an olive press, for his press, his final press, his trial. And because the value of an olive, the greatest value of an olive is that though they're good for eating and though they're good for seasoning, the greatest value of an olive is the oil. And you can't extract the oil when you, uh, you can only extract the oil when you crush it. So the greatest value of an olive is when it's crushed. That's when it's most productive. I think you get what I'm hinting at in this text. Isaiah chapter 53 says that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. It is in this place, the Garden of Gethsemane, that that garden where Jesus produces the most value. Jesus is crushed with the temptation and the trial as the sins of the world are being laid on him. He is accepting that burden of going to the cross. I mean, that's what's happening in this dark moment. That's what's happening that night in Gethsemane. Uh, and, 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 and if you've never been before, uh, if you've never been to the Garden of Gethsemane, I hope you go there. But if not, I will say this. Every single one of us has our own Gethsemane moments. You know what I'm talking about. Your own scary places, your own dark seasons, your own dark experiences. You walk into them and you may not like them. You may dislike them. They can be painful. And you pray at times, God, deliver me from this. That's why David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You have those times where you're being crushed. And some of you right now, this week, you're living out that experience of what it means to be crushed. And you ask God, why? Because he wants your life. Here's the answer to that. Because he wants your life to be of greatest value. That's why. And God is wanting to do a refining work in you. And sometimes that means a little pressing, a little crushing. And you read this and you're tempted to say, what a terrible place Jesus is in. This garden of temptation and trials. Get them out of there. Listen to me. Because we don't have a lot of time to camp out here, this is paramount, though, to anything that you're going to hear in this sermon today. might be the most important thing you hear this week or for months to come. Here it is. There is no safer place to be. There is no safer place for Jesus to be than that garden that night. Now, there, there is not a greater shelter on earth or in heaven or in the universe than in that garden. And you say, now, how is that? How can a place so dark and scary and and, and so tempting and trying, how can that be a great place to be? How can that be when you're such a place of agony and struggle? How can that be when the night is so dark, when the circumstances are so pressing, when it's such a serious moment? Here's how. Because it was in that garden, Jesus was close to his father. When he was in the most trying, tempting, tumultuous time, you find Jesus on his knees praying in fellowship with his Father. No one to be closer to in the moment than the Father. God is God. I get that. But God is not just by the title of God. God is our Father God. It was Marshall Siegel who wrote, If God has given you a love for his Son, he has his love on you as a Father. This is by far the most precious title or name we could ever give to God, and that is Father. Yes, God is righteous. God is our ruler. God is all-knowing. God is all-wise. God is all-powerful. God is ever-present, but God is also Father. He's our affectionate Father. He is our comforting Father. He's our compassionate Father. God is our good and generous Father. He's our listening Father. He's our courageous Father. He's our encouraging Father. God is our sovereign Father, meaning He's overall, but He's also our sacrificial Father who gave us His only begotten Son so that we could be saved. So Jesus is close to His Father. What better place to be than to be sheltered in the arms of His Father? Psalm 46, 1, we read it earlier. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 91, I've heard this read multiple times this week. Psalm 91, verse 2 says, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. 
Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Psalm 18, 2. The Lord is my rock. He's my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, my horn of salvation, my stronghold. He was comforted. He was close to his father. He was also comforted in his father's will. I'm going to share more about that in a moment. But I want you to skip down to this next part. He was cared for by holy angels. No safer place to be. No more sheltered place to be. No, no one on earth could strengthen the Lord. You take a look in verse 43. And, and, and it says that Jesus, after this had happened, um, he, he, he rose and, and an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. God sent an angel to comfort Jesus in this moment. Think about where Jesus is mentally. Think about where he is emotionally, physically. Think about spiritually where Jesus is. Satan is obviously nearby. He would have killed him right then and there if he would have had the power to do so, to try and ruin God's plan. But an angel came and strengthened him in the moment. No safer place to be, no shelter, more sheltered place to be than right here in the garden. And I want to finish up here. He had a commission to complete. And that leads us to this final point, this final detail. I want you to see not just the shelter. I don't want you just to see the seriousness in the garden. I want you to see, lastly, the surrender in the garden. I, I truly believe this. In verse 42, some of those powerful words that Jesus ever said. He said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, to focus on this. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus said those precious words in verse 42, nevertheless, not my will, but your will, the battle was won. Victory happened. When he committed this situation, this circumstance over, the God, over to God, the decision was made. I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow through with what I've been called to do. If this is what you want, God, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to accomplish what you sent me to do. I'm going to complete that work in which you sent for your glory so that others will know you, so that others will be saved. Satan, you're through. I win. You lose. In my own will, Jesus says in my own will, I don't, I don't, I don't want to drink this cup there has to be another way. The cup of suffering and shame and agony is so great, unbearable. I need you to understand what is before Jesus, okay? What's in this cup that he's about to drink? Tomorrow evening, Jesus is going to suffer the cup of God's wrath and punishment. He's going to be crushed for our iniquities, as Isaiah tells us. He's going to drink that cup. He's going to hang from a cross. The very next day, he's going to cry out from the cross, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And when he says those words, not your will, but mine, not as I want, but what you want, Jesus is surrendering his will over to the Lord's will. He's surrendering everything, his circumstances, the pain he's experiencing, the death he's soon going to have over to his father. He says, God, it's all yours. My life is all yours. This garden is not a place of defeat, but victory. This garden is a place of surrender. I, I want to share with you a few things about surrender, and I'm finished. While God's plan may not be popular, you keep this in mind. It must be pursued above our own. And while it may be desired, uh, or it may not be desired all of the time for, for what you're going to have to endure, it positions you well into alignment with his will. Surrender is never an easy concept. You think about surrender and you think about a loss. You think about surrender and you think about somebody giving up. This is particularly true in our social media saturated me Christ society. But you can't skip it. If you want to pr pursue God fully as his disciple, you have to learn to give over what you say is yours and give it over to him. God has so many benefits and blessings in store for those who will surrender themselves in line with his will. Living under his reign and authority means that you begin to see things as he does. You begin to see the big picture. You begin to forsake what the world has to offer and you begin to believe in the promises and that you are falling in line with his plans instead of your own. If you want that victorious life, if you want that abundant life, if you want that peace, you have to move from yourself. 
You have to move from that independency and you have to completely surrender and have dependency upon God. I know that's not always easy. I know that that can be very painful. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense. But why do you, but, but who do you want to have the victory? Is, it your, is your life for him? That's surrender. That's what Jesus declared in the garden. In one of the darkest moments in history, Jesus gave us light into great truth about what it means to get the most out of our relationship with God, to get the most out of our intimacy with God. And it came with these words, your will be done. Your will be done. When Jesus was being pressed from all sides, he gave up his life for the will of the Father's. And it proved to be so worth it because the most powerful truth I want you to see in this text is this. You are never more powerful than when you have surrendered fully to God's plan. Think about what happens next as Jesus surrenders to his father's plan. He's arrested. He's tried. He's crucified. He dies. From the cross, he proclaims, though, it's finished. The work is done. The mission of God has been accomplished. Our sins paid for by his blood being shed, finished on the cross. The most powerful moment in history happened in the darkest of days. In God's kingdom, those days, those dark days are not exits. In God's kingdom, those dark days are not defeats. In God's, in God's perspective, they're not obstacles or losses. Their victories, their opportunities to shine for Christ. You see the example of Christ right here in the garden that night. You see his surrender. The challenge to you, follow in his steps. Because when you give all to him, the best is coming. Because when Christ died on that cross and proclaimed it was finished, three days later, he rose again and proved to be that the darkest moment was the most shining moment. Let me pray for you today. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the powerful word of God. I'm grateful, Lord, for the very example that Jesus sets before us right there in the Garden of Gethsemane, the darkest place that that you look in Scripture, one of the darkest places that, 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 that we think from our perspective would be a place of defeat and loss and isolation. But never before have we seen such peace in the heart of Jesus than when he says, Lord, it isn't about what, what I want. It's about what you want. Not, not, not my will, but your will be done. I, I pray, God, that we would learn to live like that. That we would learn to see things through the awesome perspective of our Father. That we would cling to his truth and his promises. That we would know that we don't need to be afraid in the darkest nights. We, we, we don't need to be afraid in the storm. We don't need to panic. We don't need to give in to fear or our anxiety. Or what we know to do, we, God, want to give in to you. We want to surrender to your will. I I pray, I pray, God, that we would see the seriousness of the moment uh, right now as as there is right now. Perhaps there's someone that's listening um, today that is, uh, is far from God. And they don't have that peace that we've been talking about. As a matter of fact, that if, if, if truth be told, their life right now reflects, uh, reflects a lot of panic, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, and a lot of self-help. Right now, God, I pray that you would intervene and that you would convict and change hearts as, as we're praying today. If there's someone that's listening that, that's saying, I'm tired of giving in to the fear. I, I'm tired of giving in to the temptation. I'm tired of the devil having a field day with my life and my circumstances. And I want peace in that. I, I want life in that. I, I want truth in that. I, I can tell you right now, give your heart to Christ and he'll give you peace. He will give you peace beyond all understanding. He, he will give you peace that this world can never give. And so right now, as, as we're praying, Lord, I, I, I ask in Jesus' name that if someone wants to put their faith in Christ, that they would do that in this moment. Everything that they need to have has already been given to them. Christ has come. He has died on the cross for their sins. He's been raised to life. He has paid the penalty for their sins. And he gives them freedom through his name. And so, Lord, if someone today needs to trust in Jesus, right where they are, they can pray, Father... I come to you as a sinner in need of salvation. I need your grace, oh God. I need your, for, I need your forgiveness. I, I, I need to be cleansed. And I believe on you. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he came, that he died for me, that he rose for me, 
And I believe that the, the, the free gift of salvation that he offers is mine if I would trust in him in faith. And so, God, I look to you. I trust in you right now. I receive you as Savior and Lord of my life. I turn from my fears. I turn from my wickedness. I, I turn from my sin. And I put my full faith in Jesus. I surrender. I surrender. God, I want to pray today for those that their hearts are troubled and maybe they are followers of Jesus God, you have called us to live completely differently. I, I was very blessed and thankful for a brother who reminded me of that just a day ago. That as Christians, we are supposed to see the world in a different perspective. We're supposed to live differently. It's not supposed to be a, a mundane, boring, predictable life. No, a life in Christ is a life of adventure and excitement and freedom. Freedom that we've never experienced before until we know Christ. And I pray, God, that you would bring us out of that pit out of that despair, out of that discouragement, and that our hearts would be encouraged by knowing that we serve the God of peace. You think about the names of Jesus, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. In Christ, we have all peace. I pray, Lord, today for those that need to surrender, surrender their circumstances, surrender their fear, surrender into the hands of almighty God. Lord, I, I'm thankful for the time we've had together today in the Word. I'm thankful, God, for our church family. I pray that they would intentionally spend time in your Word today as a family. Maybe, maybe this morning, Sunday school groups are meeting, small groups are meeting. I pray, Lord, today to be just an anointed, spirit-filled day. And God, we're going to glorify you through it all. We continue to lift up this circumstance that our, that our world is in. And God, I pray, I'm going to pray a bit of a different prayer today. We pray, God, that our will would not be accomplished in it, but yours would be done. There's something bigger, there's something greater that you may want to accomplish. And I know that we have our demands, and I know that we have, um, we have our reasons for wanting this to be out of here. I myself am included. I'm ready for all this to be over too, but um, you hold the keys. You're in control. And God, if you're slowing us down, if you're trying to change our perspective on how church is to be done in the United States, if you're humbling us, if you, God, are, are laying a seedbed for revival, then we want you to take your time, Lord. Do what, you, do what you will. Accomplish what you must. Help us to glorify you through. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to continue on um, uh, with those that are in our Midway family. Uh, got a few things that I want you to, to keep in mind. Remember, um, over the next couple of weeks, uh, we're not going to be meeting together here. So Wednesday night, we'll have a stream um, at 7 o'clock, worship service together. Going to continue our study um, through Matthew. Um, next Sunday, March 29th, we really do hope that it's the last time that we'll have to do the live stream and, uh, uh, you know, we can actually be back together. But we don't know what the future holds. Uh, but we're going to have the same format um, next Sunday morning, we'll, we'll be joining here together for, for, uh, for worship to bring, to bring to your home through, through this live stream. So I encourage you to invite somebody to be a part with you. Um, I, I, I'm thankful that we have this, this means to be able to do this today. So thank you for being with us. A couple of things that people have asked questions about. It, with, with our church campus being, being closed um, for the next couple of weeks, all the events that were planned between now and March 29th, They've been either postponed or they've been canceled. But there's a couple of things that we are going to try to do. Perhaps uh, by April 4th, uh, our youth group will be able to serve our seniors. That may be different than what we initially planned or had an idea with. Uh, but, but there are things that we can do on that day. So it's possible. Um, it's possible that we will have Love Our Seniors Day on April 4th. As far as I know, um, the April 24th Bluegrass and Barbecue um, uh, benefit for the Spanish Church, as far as I know, it's still on. Uh, but we know that that, that, may, that may change throughout the week, too. Again, we're not, we're not sure um, what the future holds. But I do know uh, those that plan to go to the, uh, the Carolina and Hoppers concert, that event has been uh, rescheduled. So it's going to be on May 21st. Um, it was supposed to be this past Thursday, but it's been rescheduled to May 21st. I, I do know that. So your tickets weren't bought in vain. If you'll, uh, if you'll look on your emails, um, there, there should be a, a copy of the bulletin for today. Um, you can take a look at it, uh, see what, what, I was going to say what's happening, what's not happening <laughs> here at Midway this week. Uh, but I do pray that you'll have a blessed, a blessed Sunday. Again, thank you for being with us. And this is just another awesome time to praise God for those who, uh, who helped make this possible this morning. I want to remind you to give. Um, just because we're not able to, uh, to be here together doesn't mean that God's kingdom work stops. Um, so, so if you have opportunity, um, you can come by on Tuesday through Friday. 
uh, 4.30 to 6.30, and you can drop off um, your offering then. Uh, we also have um, uh, set up online for, for giving, so you can go on our website, mwbaptist.org, and then there's a section um, title or tab called Give. It's a step-by-step, really easy uh, process to give online. But let's, uh, let's be generous, um, especially uh, to the ministries and missions that, that we're a part of, um, because they, they don't end. So I pray that you'll have a blessed week. Hope to see you again on Wednesday night. God bless you.